Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 63. Glad you could join us. Today, Bonnie and I are joined by Ken and Carrie Davison of Holy Heroes. The Davisons bring a wealth of wisdom and encouragement to the conversation, and many of you will already be familiar with their offerings over at holyheroes.com. It was an inspiring meeting amongst the Colby family. Enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, liturgical musician, popcorn and podcast fanatic, and Colby homeschooling mom to four lads and lasses of middle and high school age. And I'm Jordan. As a product of homeschooling, I'm proud to teach Greek and Latin for Colby online and serve as the alumni and public relations director. If I say the names AJ, Skiff, or Father Leopold, many of our listeners will know immediately whom I'm talking about. In fact, those characters might well be household names for a good number of our Colby families. Today, I'm happy to welcome Mr. and Mrs. Ken and Carrie Davison, the Holy Heroes' dad and mom, and Colby homeschooling family to the Colby cast. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Davison. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We are delighted to have you here. We have Jordan Elmanzar here with us, too, to talk to you guys. So yeah. long drives to and from the parochial school our children used to attend meant audiobooks and glory stories. So we've listened to many of them several times. <laughs> Alter Gang episodes were repeat listens as well. It's part of our family lexicon. We'll just throw out references to the various glory stories we've listened to over the years and, and videos we've watched that you all have done and the mass prep, which we will get to and things like that. So we'd love to get to know you a bit, Mr. and Mrs. Davison, and hear about your homeschooling life and how Colby Academy factors into that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we have homeschooled always um, from the beginning, and we didn't really intend that necessarily, but it's it's just what happened. And I'm very grateful for it, we both are. We have eight children, and six have graduated from high school already, which is shocking to me. And they graduated from Colby, the uh, high school. They all got a high school degree from Colby. And we're grateful for that as well, because that has had a great impact on our family. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a convert, and Carrie is a revert. That's how we ended up homeschooling. There was a, a family in our neighborhood where the kids were always the ones that were the leaders of all the kids, all the activities and things to do. And uh, we got interested in homeschooling, and that was about the same time that I was being introduced to things in the Catholic Church, and my wife was being reintroduced, so we decided we would homeschool the kids, and then we had to find a Catholic curriculum yeah. to do it, so that's how we, we came into this. Those That family down the street was not Catholic. They were evangelical Protestants, and they were a beautiful family, and we just loved them, and they evangelized us, actually, into Protestantism, which we ended up being Catholic, okay? We overshot. We overshot. We, we, went. we overshot. We went, from, we went from nothing and we shot right through and ended up Catholic. We ended up Catholic, right. Right where you're meant to be. So then how did you find Colby then? Is that when you started using Colby is from the beginning? No, I used everything. And you have to remember 25 years ago, there was not much. I mean, there were a lot of different things, but there wasn't, there was no internet. You had to go to a conference somewhere to find things and talk to people you had to find the right church you had to find the homeschool group it was it was a bit of a project so it took a long time of sorting out and figuring out and it was kind of a building experience and so on and off during the years i was always in and out of colby and using colby things and colby has changed as well over the years it become better as you know as you work through things but then at high school the high school level it just fit very well with our family so that was when my oldest finally got to high school. It was kind of an, it just worked well. And I was always very happy with the syllabuses. I was happy with the, just the rigor of the work and the flexibility. So it worked, it worked out great for us because we have a business. And so we're, and my, our kids are very busy. They do year round sports. They work for us. They work in the business. It's a lot. And it kind of always kept us on track. So they can, manage things with the syllabus and then they will have kids say dad i want to come to the office and and do some work on something because they want access to me which is great and and that's what's been really nice about it is we can work through the syllabus and they can identify the issues that they have and come to either one of us or actually as the older kids got older they would 
pop in and help. In fact, we just had it just this last weekend where we had one of the older kids helping Lily and helping Caroline. And uh, that's also a really nice thing <laughs> when, when they get used to it and they know how it all works, then mom and dad are freed up as well. Yeah. Sure, sure. Sure. Well, that business you're referring to is familiar probably to many of our listeners, but we'd love to hear more about it. The, the Holy Heroes story. How did Holy Heroes come to be? I, I was I was working another as, as part of my conversion. So I was working another organization and a couple of us decided we wanted to do some saint stories, specifically Blessed Imelda, who's the patroness of First Communicants. And uh, we said we could do this story in an audio format, which would be great. And it turned out better than we expected. And we also then at the same time did St. Juan Diego uh, with completely different casts. And more people heard these and piled in and offered to help. And pretty soon we had a whole group of volunteers all over the country writing, producing voices and things. And it just grew from there. The interesting thing is I think the third glory story we did was about St. Miguel de la Mora, one of the seven Knights of Columbus saints. And the little boy who was the young Miguel de la Mora took Miguel de la Mora as his confirmation saint. Yeah. And he actually produced Glory Stories, volume 16, St. Peter, years later. And uh, that was that's really fun. because he's, he's, I understand how to do it. <laughs> I, I understand what yeah. it's all about. And I want to be part of it. So um, it's nice to see that growth. And it has. And the other thing was we started making these. Ken was writing these and putting them together. And part of it was for us, for our family, for our children. And it just kind of grew out from there. And, you know, he always had a, another job, like, to support us. And then at some point, you know, when we started Holy Heroes, it was too much. It was too much to have a full-time job and to try and, you know, have this side Catholic job in the faith. And so then we had to make the decision, and we did, to make that our whole you know, our only source of income and our whole life kind of, and we did it and it's been great. God's been very good to us. And it was only until the later ones that the kids said, we want to be in them too. We don't want to just listen to the glory I know. stories. We and want our, to be in them as And our well. kids are in them. They're all sprinkled through with different voices. So for us, it's, it's really endearing. Mm -hmm. And we also like, so now our granddaughter who's three recites Blessed Imelda to us and is insisting on receiving her first communion. And it's really a, a interesting, I'm reliving it again with grandchildren now. And I'm realizing, isn't this so interesting how important, and I, you know this, and you know this in your heart, and you know this in your life, but when you see it again and again, how important early formation is, you know, at the very most tender age of this, because she has this memorized, and, and she's, in her heart feeling this. And it's such an interesting thing and beautiful thing to witness again. And then as when we moved here, so we have kids born all over the country. Yeah. So we're, you know, so these are the California kids and these are the Minnesota kids and the Connecticut kids and everything. So when we moved out here is when we, we started going beyond the glory stories and all the other things that are part of Holy Heroes, specifically the adventures. Yeah. So we started with Advent Adventure, and, and the purpose was, let's just teach kids by doing little videos. A few times a week is all I said. Let's just do this a few times a week and explain Advent things for, for Catholic kids. So they know this is not Christmas, it's Advent, it's preparation. You have a, what the Advent wreath is and the blessings of the various things, etc. So like often happened, I said, this would be a fun idea. And then the people that went with the idea went too far. In this case, my wife and the kids they said, well, we're not going to do it a few times a week. We're going to do it every single day. And we had some poor priest who was reviewing all the theology and all the scripts. And he said, I, you know, he says, I thought this was like two or three a week. And I think I've already reviewed eight. Aren't you done? Uh, so they would do these videos and we had to deal with the technology back then of how you upload them. And it was all, all very complicated and, and difficult. But at the end of Advent Adventure, one of the kids in the final one said, see you in Lent. 
and oh. uh, <laughs> and we found that we volunteered to do Lenten adventure yeah. as well. I mean, a program, uh, and in fact, it, it went all the way through to our second oldest child actually wrote a Marian consecration adventure using three of the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and, and she created this program for kids of Marian consecration from listening to the words that Our Lady actually spoke to St. Juan Diego, to the Fatima children, to St. Bernadette. And they said, you know, this will really resonate with children. A mother, what are the things that she's saying to her children? So we've run that several times. But again, it's, it, it grew up. That was a little girl when we first did Advent Adventure, and now she's a mother. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they've all, all written the thing. So it's it's very fun. We've also got a spiritual adoption prayer adventure that goes 40 weeks. So you can spiritually adopt a child. And again, it's the kids doing everything on camera and some of the little fun things that, that we always see. They always say, hello, I'm Anna, one of your guides. I'm Therese, one of your guides. And then at the end, they always wave and say goodbye. And we hear from mothers that all their children are waving. <laughs> And uh, when they'll see us in conferences, they're, they're just amazed. They it's, look it's, and they know you. It's beautiful. It, it has been super fun. Hard in some ways, but super fun as well. Well, we've enjoyed seeing your kids grow up. We've watched the mass prep videos over the years. We've done the Advent and Lent adventures over the years. And it's neat when one will come up from several years ago. I and mean, what a neat treasure for you all to have the chronicle of them and your business, this apostolate you have been serving through what a neat way to be able to look back over time and see where it started and, and how it's going. So to that end, you've mentioned what some of your kids are up to now and you have grandchildren. And and so where are they now? Are they all over the place or did they work with you at the business? And A uh, couple still work with us and three are married and three are in college and two are home working with us. <laughs> And, go, and doing and doing high school. <laughs> so the ones that are still at home, they work. They don't get paid as much. <laughs> but but the ones the ones that are married, when they in, in fact the, the first child, Clara, who started working for us, I didn't know she was going to work for us. But she came in and started setting things up. This is my desk, and it turns out she talked to all the other kids that this is what she, what she's doing. This is her full time job now. Yeah. And uh, so she she negotiated, of course, a salary. So uh, she's working very. So she hard. works for us, and then our, some of the others they do different do contract things. work. Con and things, they do but. some projects for us, and I think everyone is kind of still doing a little bit of things on an as needed basis, and depending on how busy they are as well. In fact, we just had Trey, who was in his third year at the Air Force Academy. Now he came back and had to record That's right. for a prayer kit that we're creating. We were doing research on what we need, what they wanted, and we said, we need to create this. And Trey was home. And he has a great voice. So we brought him in, and uh, Trey came in, and he went reverted back to the adventure guide, Trey, and, and recorded things for us. Yeah, that's right. where he left off probably, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like he did that. a pro bono, so I'm very impressed with him. Wow, yeah. that was, <laughs> I was just reading about that. You have three who are still in the Air Force Academy right now? We have three. two that are in the Air Force Academy and one that's a Falcon Scholar at another school. She's given a Falcon Scholarship, so she goes next year to the Air Force Academy. Correct. So we have, oh, cool. um, I know it's it's kind of amazing to us too. For our yeah, so Trey always wanted to be in the military, and so that's where he is. And then the next two were a little bit more of a surprise, but I can I, I completely see how that fits. Because yeah, Anna and Trey went through Colby together. Yeah. And they graduated together, and then she went to uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for a year, and then decided she wanted to go to the Air Force Academy. So. That's where she is That's now. That's where she is now. And she's finally a year behind him. After yeah, all, these all these years of being in the same grade, she is now a year behind. She's a year behind. And it's a good education for her. I, it's very interesting where it takes your kids. You know, So I, I will tell you, Colby has been a huge help in our children who are very different in their whole, educationally very different, but they've really gotten to places they wanted to be. Our son is a very, uh, he's a very history, 
theology kind of driven young man. And yet he got everything he needed to get into the Air Force Academy. Our daughter is a complete math girl. She's a perfect fit for the Air Force Academy because it's all STEM. It's all engineering. And yet she got all the background she needed in in the liberal arts to be able to write well and have a really broad background in that in high school. So it's been very good. We love hearing the experiences of where the Colby alumni and where they go after Colby. And we've had many conversations with those who've gone on to further studies in the liberal arts and also a few with others who have gone into STEM fields. And that's something we hope to hear more about as we go forward in our podcast season. So that's great to hear you have some of all of it in your household. Yeah. And some of our listeners might be wondering how you fit in homeschooling while running a family business. So what might you tell them to that end? I actually don't see how we could have done this while our kids were in school because I actually see homeschooling as a very efficient way to educate your children. I I see friends whose children are in school and so much of their experience of schooling is getting the children ready to go to school, doing everything at the whim of the school, planning what the school wants and running to the store for this and getting, driving them there or getting them on the bus and picking them up and then coming home and doing school again after eight hours. And and I'm thinking, good grief. So you just had, your kid was gone all day. And then at three o'clock, you have to pick them up, bring them home and then do more school. Where for us, we get up, you know, you say your prayers or you go to mass or, and you start school. You do your school, you eat your lunch. And for the little kids, it's done. And then for the bigger kids, they do it on their own. They just keep working and eventually they're done and we move on with our day. You go to sports, you go to your piano lessons, you work in the office, all kinds of things. And high school kids can do their school at night, on the weekends. It's really at my discretion, you know, our discretion. So if we need you to work or if you need to, you know, get your hours in for whatever it is you're doing, you can get it in and you can plan, you can plan your week and your life based on what you need and what your family needs instead of what the school demands. And it's, it's a good incentive too, because if we're going to a conference or something, we got plenty of children to choose from. <laughs> And if they're not, uh, if, if, you're, if you're not up on your schoolwork and they know it and, yeah. that, and that's the good thing. So they will, you know, here's what I'm going to do. And the times when yeah. I haven't done everything, they really will work in the car and they will they get, uh, they will get it done. They'll, they'll, they'll get it done. So it, it gives them, you know, some other experience to, to break up the school, to give them a reason to do it. And like Carrie said at the beginning, they'll bring these from the theology classes and things like that, they'll bring these insights because I still do it. I still send it to the kids in college and I still send it to the, the moms, you know, that are all graduated. Our eldest daughter is working as a counselor and I'll send them things from the business. Look at this, tell me what you think. Do a little market research with your, your friend moms uh, and, and things like that. So they're still involved uh, as much as yeah, they can be and they bring... Uh, that sort of experience and their education in to make recommendations on what will work and what doesn't work. And in fact, we were talking about that the prayer kit for all the time that you're spending in the car to help with what parents said they'd like to do to make it productive prayer time. We had an idea and I found the email from my eldest daughter from Virginia. And she says, that would be a good idea, but I really still think we ought to do what Lucy likes in the car. That's, that's our great and, and we added oh, we added five songs, five prayer songs, because it says this is what will quiet Lucy down in the car seat whenever I put it on. And I said, great, tell me what the songs are specifically. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so she was able to just immediately say, here are the five songs. When they play, she sings in the car. And now she knows her angel of God prayer and she knows her things like that. So they're still involved. If you're built in that, focus groups that way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, it is, and we have our own built in focus group. But I also think it's, it is a great thing about grandchildren because I remember part of the glory story attraction for me was that I was so, I just didn't want my kids growing up in front of the television. And the beauty of, an audio story is that they really have to use their own imagination. It really gets in their mind and their thoughts 
and they make their own story in their head. And I think in our video world that we have, and I, you know, we make videos, kids love to watch each, the, the Advent Adventure and Lent Adventure and the part a component of that is video. So that's useful too. But I really believe the audio prayers, the audio stories are so important to the development of a child's mind and in, in the development of their faith, because mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like, a, I, I'm not saying it's like mass, but I'm saying, you know, at mass, God is giving you imagination for a reason. Like at mass, the child's there with their ears and they're, they're watching the altar and their imagination of what's happening. And I think that it's, you know, to be constantly, we, I think you lose a bit of your imagination with video. Uh, I think that's really interesting, Carrie, what you said, that you have to use the different part of your brain when you're just listening to something. And some of my earliest memories are from listening to like records that my parents had that I would put on that had stories and they've stuck with me much more than any cartoons I watched as a kid. I, I would never even remember. I was homeschooled also and I, I have tons of gratitude for my upbringing that my parents, it was, it was before there were all the resources that we have now and all of that, but somehow they managed and did it. And I just, I, I feel so grateful to them now and I hope I've expressed that enough to them, but are your kids now at that age where they look back and they they tell you thank you for for doing this for us yes actually that is actually a very gratifying thing when your children get old enough to say and you know some of them express it a lot more than others but pretty much they've all said at some point and it actually starts when they go to college they say thank you you know they've had experiences where other people are not as prepared for school or people are making very bad decisions and they see the repercussions of that. And, and at first it confuses them. They're like, what, what's happening here? And then they start saying, I'm so glad you, you didn't leave me, you know, you didn't expose me to this, or I'm so glad I had this opportunity. And pretty much all of our kids have said that. And some of them have really gushed about it to their friends, which is so kind of fun. But uh, that doesn't happen. Don't expect, I'm not saying parents expect that. Okay. But <laughs> they will eventually say, I recognize the sacrifices you made and I recognize the opportunities you gave us. And they're very grateful. And in fact, my kids, and this is without prompting from me, our older ones are saying, I'd like to homeschool my children. I would like to have, have them have the same experience that I had in the faith and in their, and, and, and I wanna just say something else here. Um, part of it is, I mean, the most important part obviously is faith. And I've seen in all of them that they're grateful for that. And, but I also see part of it is just family. They're also grateful for their experiences living in, in our family because they had more time with, with each other. So, cause my children are each other's best friends. And for a parent, to, that's a very happy thing for us. Yeah, you know, a lot of this is, is like we say, we're trying to get into your imagination and, and there's kind of a passive, when you're watching a video, you're, you're more passive. You're, you're there to be entertained and, and you can be critical and, and things like that. When it's audio, it's like radio. It's like talking to the folks in Catholic radio. They say, it's, you're alone. It, you're alone listening. Even if you're all listening in a group, and you, you have to be a little, not a little bit, but much more active in your brain to try to work through this. And it's interesting because when we do the glory stories, we took a little bit of that Protestant bit with us where you, we're going to put a Bible verse in there, but we cheat. We cheat. What's the Bible verse that we put in there? We go to the beatification or the canonization homily and we do what the Pope said. You know, so this is what this saint exhibited. So we put that in there to give them a framework. And then we let the story be told and we try to be as accurate as possible with the, with the modern saints where you're getting the exact words of the saints. So you and I will listen to this and hear it at a different level than a child will. And the child also grows and begins to understand it, but they, they have to work with it. And, and one of the most amazing voicemails we got a few years ago, the St. Joan of Arc story, the, um, Bible verses, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, because that was perseverance was, in fact, in the in the canonization homily, it said, you know, this perseverance of feeling like this is what God called me to do, 
even though I have no experience in it at all. Uh, but I'll just keep doing what I'm told to do. And uh, this woman called up and she left us a voicemail. It was long after hours. She said, I'm just getting back from the emergency room. I have to tell you, my child fell on the swing set and his tooth went through his lip or something like that. So there's terrible blood everywhere. And the other little kids are, are all upset. She says, and this, he, he was at the age where he still had to sit in a car seat. So she said, they put him in a car seat and he's crying and he's in pain put him in the van in the car seat and I'm driving to the emergency room. And pretty soon he stops crying, but I hear that he's mumbling something. He's, he's, he's saying something. She says, so I'm stopped at a, at a stoplight and I kind of turn the fan down so I can try to make up what he's saying. And he was back there saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And she says, I just want to tell you, you know, that's his story. And he gets it. You don't have to, pounded into him he got it and we hear similar types hear of that. things yeah. where where mothers say that there's a favorite story or a couple of favorite stories with the children so we really have high hopes with blessed carlo acutis who, who is the most recent one you know what died 15 years ago his junior high friends were at his beatification you know this is a, a boy who died in 2006 at 15 well the woman who wrote that is Italian. She's an Italian American and she is corresponding with his mother in Italian, getting specific stories and things. What did he say? What would he do? You know, what were these issues? What was his family like? So we have great hopes that that's going to touch all sorts of children because his life was as a child. Yeah. And this is what he did as a child. And this is what he thought and said as a child. And you're going to hear it. Not my interpretation of it as an old guy, but you're going to hear the story. And, and I just have to believe that children are going to hear things and pick up things on a level that's going to really speak to them that I couldn't do if I was making up a story. And, and that's what we try to do with all the glory stories is let the saints speak for themselves. We were just talking recently with a couple of the middle school teachers for the Colby Online School, and they referenced Blessed Carlo Acutis as being a particularly well-suited, blessed for our Colby students for mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons. Very cool. That's very cool. That story you tell of the little boy in the car, that coming to his mind at that particular time. Wow, that's so moving. And for her as well, I'm sure that would brought her great comfort. Glad she yeah. let you all know that. It's, it's actually the one of the most lovely things that people email us or call us and leave message and say, I want, just want you to know that my grandson was saying this line out of your, and it's actually the words of the saints. It's, it's quite lovely. And, it, and again, it just goes to the whole importance of teaching children in any way possible, their faith through any examples or thought. But I do actually believe um, there is something about audio and reading, of course, too, but I, I'm saying versus visual, and I'm not against videos. I'm just saying that that part, for some reason, because we have this huge video explosion, the idea of just using audio has, and some people just go right past it, and I think they miss a, a, an incredible inroad into their children's minds. Oh, sure. And as much driving as we do, that's a yes. perfect opportunity for lots of good listening time. And even if you, uh, I mean, if you use video, it's it's like if you're going to exercise, you wouldn't just do one exercise over and over if you can change them up. And then also faith comes by hearing, I think means it has a special meaning to us even now, just in the way that, that you were describing how it can affect affect a child. I think that's so, so neat. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one of the one of the other things that we always get every Lent, we, a Lenten adventure, we go station by station through the stations of the cross and we also go step by step through the mass and it's it's great to break it up and and then the kids get to ponder it and think about it we're and and you know what it's like you're thinking of what, what's coming next we're so familiar with it but with young children it's the first time through and what we always get at the end of lent are emails and calls from mothers saying is there something wrong with my son because my son 
wants to do the Station of the Cross. He wants to listen to the Station of the Cross. We had one saying, I have three boys. And when their uh, grandma visited, they demanded that she go over and play Stations of the Cross with them. And they're going, why are my children morbid? <laughs> so, you know, he touches boys. And it was very interesting. We had one of the Nashville Dominican sisters one time staying with us. And she was talking about differences between boys and girls and the, the nurturing nature of girls and what how when girls play, what they do, they have stories, they make houses and, and this sort of thing. And she says, boys are rougher and everything, but she just in passing, you know, said, because women love by creating and nurturing things, whereas boys show love by dying for their beloved. And that's exactly what St. Paul has in you know, Ephesians 5. Men love your wife as Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? He died for the church. And that's the insight why the Stations of the Cross really resonates with little boys. And, and because it's, it's not a visual thing, they're listening to it. It's limited by their imagination. So they're putting themselves in this position. They're wondering all these things. They're not shocked and aghast by a visual thing that they couldn't imagine. And it also reminds me similarly with this story to talk about St. Therese, where she said to her parents, I wish you'd die. And she was very little. And they said, how, how dare you say that? Well, that's how you get to heaven. And so a little boy listening to the stations of the cross and pondering this in his mind sees this is what men do. Yeah, it's an opportunity. This is an opportunity. This is really something that speaks to me. So we have to tell them, no, your son's not morbid. We oh. have seven girls and one boy. And when we first did the Stations of the Cross in audio, my son was five. In fact, he's in the audio. He's the one. He's in the audio. He's the one that's a two or three words behind in every single prayer. <laughs> you can't keep up with the sisters. But he did. Every he single it. night in Lent, he wanted to. This was back when it was, in fact, on an audio cassette. He wanted to play the cassette and do the Stations of the Cross. And he would want to stop and talk to it. So there is this added dimension that you'll see in your children by letting them ponder these things. I hadn't thought of it that way. And that's going to take on a new meaning for me the next time I pray them. But I'll be thinking about that. Well, this episode will air on the Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, nine months after the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, which is one of the reasons we hope to feature your family on this particular episode, since liturgical living is such a prominent feature of your apostolate. Um, you offer so many resources for incorporating the liturgical calendar into family life. Um, what are some of your go-tos for folks who are daunted by the prospect of, or are just getting started trying to incorporate some of the riches of the liturgical year into their family life? I think people make it harder than it really has to be. You know, if you just start saying as a family, your kids, you get them up, you say prayers, you make sure everyone says a morning, you know, at the table, a morning offering. At lunchtime, you say an Angelus together. If at three, you could say even part of a rosary or like a decade or a Divine Mercy Chaplet or something. These are like little things that you can start doing during the day. You know, and then you always make sure you say nighttime prayers with the kids. And if you can do it kind of in a little gathering place, you know, in, around the table or in the living room or something, that type of thing, if you start doing it, it starts to take structure and form your day. Like this is just what we do. And it just becomes just like getting up and brushing your teeth. Like there's certain rituals you have to mark your day. And the prayers you say throughout the day are the things that mark your day. So we would do things like I have some bells here and, and we ring the bell for the Angelus. We ring the bell. It's prayer time. And so the kids would be like, oh, there's the bell. It's time for prayers. So they would start to, it started to become just part of what they did. You know, there's no hesitation. You just ring the bell. Angelus, everyone's there at the table for lunch. Everyone's praying the Angelus. It's just another part of your day. And it becomes just, you know, second nature. And I see my kids doing things, you know, sometimes when, as they're getting older and things are getting all sporadic and people are going places and we're super busy still there's somebody you know lunchtime and so half the kids are out the door doing something and the rest are here doing something else and they just start praying the angelus together it's time for the angelus and so i think that's what people have to do is just make it part of 
simple little things and you can add to that you know mass time you can get to and then you know set it up for okay we go to mass these days or if you're you know it's every family has to make their decisions based on their situation yeah we we focus on on the mass on on mass prep we we said we're going to focus on getting you to sunday and when the pandemic hit and then it was all virtual masses and things like that we actually added some things to it and one of the things that we were asked to add was so all the reading. So we focus on the in the mass prep on the gospel and little quizzes, some little things to help you get through mass, thinking that you're in church. So we added all the readings and we heard from some families. What we would do is we would watch and do the weekly mass prep, but then we would print off these readings and we would go through them. But it's in the same structure uh, how we do it. You, you, you kind of discuss it. We're not you're not a priest. You don't have to just power through the mass. You can actually talk about it. You can actually have other people think about it. And it reminded me just today, I saw a book was published on, on children leaving the faith. And they tend to leave the faith when they leave home. And what tends to keep them in the faith? They said, well, two things keep them in the faith. One is living in a family where it's taken seriously and it's done. And I think that's what Carrie is, is, is saying, you know, we go to mass, we, we do that. We don't do it all perfectly, the Angelus every day. We sometimes forget, but you have the kids starting to say, we, we need to do this. And they take the lead, but they see that we do we pile as many people in the van to go to confession as need to go to confession. When somebody says, I need to go to confession now, we take them. We yeah. don't say no, we figure there's a reason. And you see how that's come where they start to emulate not just us, but they see it lived. And a, a great example is Trey started last year going to confession every week. You know, I, I, I was talking to him the other day. I said, you just want you to know that you have two siblings who now do the same thing. They want to go to confession every week. And I said, so it's good that you do that. And he goes, I, I'm just, I feel like I'm surrounded by people who are sinning and don't know it. And mm -hmm. he says, and I sin, but I just feel like I, I, I need to pay more attention to myself now that I'm not in the family. And you see, so that I think is the liturgical living that the family lives. But the other thing that this book just said is, and to talk about it, yes. not just live it. And I'm sure you know people like that where maybe dad is the one that is practicing or not practicing. But it's never discussed. It's never talked about. And that's the other thing that, that we really do is you discuss it. So we're, we're providing the information. We're not doing all these crafts and things like that. There are a lot of others that do crafts. We just don't have time. And it's only, you know, look at our kids. They're not crafty. Okay? Not crafty. <laughs> but, but there are some, some cycles of the liturgical year that we say you need to pay attention to, like I said, Advent. So we actually do have a craft, the, an Advent candle kit. Every year you, you make your own Advent candles. And we have people saying, I, I give them to relatives for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Their funny. Advent candles. And, and a Paschal candle for at the end of Lent. Here's the Paschal candle. I know I'm going to sing the Regina Chaley. And we just added a baptismal candle where you can make your own baptismal candle put the name, you know, it's beeswax, put the name of the child on it. We've already had these in some baptisms. The priests think this is great. And the siblings think it's fantastic. So they're thinking, they're thinking the life of a Catholic. Yeah. And then what they'll do, and you don't have to prompt them, they start looking at the calendar and say, it's my feast day. Yes. <laughs> it's my feast day. That's my middle name. And so I, I, in fact, we just got sure. off of, we have triduums for some children. Yes. Clara Jane, it's St. Clair and then St. Jane, Jane Francis de Chantel, two days in a row. Yeah. We have oh, a couple there we go. like tri or triple. So yeah. if she can hit them, believe me, the kids, will, the kids will celebrate That's on their own free will. I, I also think when, that is something I wanted to say to you about. Uh, talking about it. So I grew up um, in a culturally Catholic family where there were people who went to mass in my family. I had no idea why they went to, I, like I, growing up, it was a mystery. This is like top secret information, like no idea what 
like why people went to mass, what that was all about. There was just something you had to do. And then there were weddings and funerals and things. No idea about anything. And it was just to me when I actually grew up, you know, we became Catholic and I started learning the faith. I was just overwhelmed by the amount of significance of all of these Catholic things. And I thought to myself, why, why was this such a secret? So I, I actually think that speaking about this to your children, everything, there should be never anything that is off limits. Anything they talk about, anything they want to know about needs to be discussed. And we do. And I think that really engages older children as well. Everything from what it all means, everything, including the things that are specifically Catholic that are, quite frankly, a little odd. You know, the whole relic thing. And so my daughter was in college and she was having a conversation with a friend of hers about incorrupt bodies. OK, so her Baptist roommate was in the room. And so as she's on the phone having this whole conversation about incorrupt bodies and things like that, her Baptist roommate is Googling incorrupt bodies. OK, so my daughter gets off the phone and her roommate says, this is a thing. This is something. This is a thing. And 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 she's saying, yes, it is. She's like, how how is it that we don't know these things? You know, so it's just an interesting thing. That's how I felt when I started practicing Catholicism. I was like, how is it that people don't know this? It's so mind blowing and wonderful. The things that are, are available to us. So that's why whenever kids, you know, you get on there, you start investigating, you talk about all this because especially older kids, they love it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we do is it's not just the liturgical calendar, but again, it's the family. It's it's the family calendar. Yeah. So we have the baptismal dates of the children and they remember, OK, that's is as important, if not more important than your birthday and your feast day then, and your feast day for your name. And how many names do you have? And then you add a confirmation saint in there. Well, we're going to make sure we cover that. And the Nativity of Mary actually is one of our girls birthday. Yeah. So that's a big one. And as I said, the, the daughter that uh, works full time for Holy Heroes, she is on top of feast days and we get the cupcakes and we get. The <laughs> but, I, but before that becomes overwhelming, see, you were saying it's about families getting overwhelmed about the mm -hmm. whole Catholic living the Catholic life. It doesn't have to be that way, because I know what it was like having a bunch of kids and all these baptismal dates and birthdays and feast days. You start to get like this is just crazy. And so. It doesn't have to be that big. Like I always kept like frozen candy bars or something in the freezer or something small around the house that you could always give someone for their, you know, special day because you just didn't realize, you know, or the, the day got away from you or something. Because that's how busy family life gets sometimes is that you're just overwhelmed with little kids and everything. So I'm just saying with all this feast day and baptismal days, it doesn't have to be you're at the store every time have a bag of candy or some lollipops or you know some little treats or some box of chalk that your kids love and there you go this is a special treat for the baptismal day the feast day even the birthday I remember my husband telling me when before we were married a priest mentioning that idea at one of the family baptisms like put this date on your calendar that's something that was important to him from the get-go like this is something that we will need to celebrate these baptismal days these spiritual birthdays let's let's do this and that really spoke to him at the time that's been something that we've we've tried to incorporate into our life and and we have actually made your advent candles we have four children so they each make one and they really get into it it's really neat and they have i need to get ours for this year and and uh, we've also done the Easter candle, except ours, we rolled the wax the wrong way, so it's a little squattier. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You've got 50 it's days to burn it, right? Yeah. It was not apparent until we went to put the decorations on, and you're like, oh, this is not going to go all the way around. But oh well. <laughs> your children will remember that. Okay, so we had a uh, one of our daughters when they got married and they were doing their wedding dance, the music stopped. Their recording ended it, just, it, it didn't work and everyone in the entire room started singing the song oh. and our priest was there and he said you know this is like the best thing that could have happened because everyone will remember this you know this beautiful moment because everyone just start, sang it for them to dance to and so things like that that don't exactly work out well it's, those are the actual things you remember mm -hmm. um, how you fill in and make that work somehow 
that's so true. And it becomes fun family lore also. Yes. I love the baptismal candles. That would be a neat idea for godparents or the siblings. I love hearing the sibling idea for the siblings to make the baptismal candles. Right. That's a neat idea. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And you personalize it, put their little name on it. Yeah. And then you save it for, for later and you can use it at their wedding. And it's, you know, these are things that your kids remember. They remember making candles. They remember, the, the, you know, you're trying to create, you're saying Catholic family life. And you're trying to create kind of a, an atmosphere in your family of little rituals and little things they remember, even small things. And it doesn't have to be big. And, and that's what I think people need to remember. Well, and you have so many things available, including the Marian consecration, which would be great for this feast day, and the Jesse tree for Advent. If it's any consolation to anyone listening, I've tried the Jesse tree for a number of years. I think last year we got most of the days in. We had to double up some days, <laughs> but that would be the first year that we've gotten close to hitting most of the days of Advent of the Jesse tree days. So every okay. other year previous, it has been hit or miss. So Okay. Well, the reason we made that Jesse tree from the beginning is that from the beginning of becoming Catholic, I had my little Bible story out and I was like, we're going to read one of these every single day and I'm going to make the Jesse tree and we're going to get through this for Advent. I never was able to do it. It became like a big failure and I was always feeling bad about it. And then my kids didn't know what was going on. I was trying to say, no, it's the Jesse tree. And so we made the Jesse tree. I was like, anything is better than what I was doing. So we made the Jesse tree and actually so many emails we get are from moms. I've never finished a Jesse tree until you made this because it's just, it's hard. It's a very busy time of the year. You're trying to do Advent. And then in our culture, you're trying to get ready for Christmas and you're trying to do school and you're trying to fit in all this other stuff. And then you're trying to do a Jesse tree mm -hmm. on top. It's, it's a lot. So that's why we made it. And it, it's been pretty successful for a lot of people. You guys have been a big part of our, of our being able to live the liturgical year as part of the rhythm of our family life. So I'm a long time fan, as you all can tell. <laughs> Thank you. I was on your website earlier, which we'll definitely send out to the listeners. And I, I love how it's sort of crystallized in this moment of your family's life where the children are obviously in those portraits younger than, than they are now, as you yeah. described. But it looks like that was really a special time with the business and with the family, which sound like they're pretty much the same thing. They are. It's very integrated, the whole thing. I, I look at our family like I've never lived on a farm. OK, so I don't really know what that's like. But I have this idea in my mind that if I did live on a farm and I were a farmer with animals and things, my children would all work as part of that. You know, they would be out there doing farm things. OK, my father-in-law grew up on a farm. So that was my image of what it was like. Of course, that was a long time ago. But I, I think of my kids like that, like they grew up on our farm in our business and they all did little pieces here and there. And some of it was required as just chores and some of it was they wanted to help and do different things. So that's that's kind of how I looked at it there. I think a lot of people can relate to that and recognizing that it's a group effort. This is our family life. It's all part of it. With homeschooling, we get that opportunity to see how the running of the household actually happens and as opposed to what you were saying when children go to school then they come home and things have happened at home and they have like no almost idea. as if by magic right so here's another opportunity them seeing how the business how that happens they're a part of it that they help make it happen and you know I'm not saying that this doesn't happen with school children because I, I know families that do make it happen with their school children but I do think that homeschooling it, it does make it easier to incorporate your children into the running of the home. And they do, they do have a greater appreciation for what actually happens and what needs to be done, you know, to get it, because they're not out the door for eight hours a day. They're actually living in the house and they see dinner has to be prepped and the baby has to be taken care of and the laundry has to be done. And they're usually a part of all of that as well as doing their school. I mean, I just had a conversation with one of my daughters and she was actually saying this to me. She said, I actually can you know, do all these things while doing all this other stuff as well. It's not even, a, it's just part of who I am. And I'm actually kind of amazed at my older kids now. And I attribute this to being in my family because I know what I was like as a 26 year old. Okay. I had nothing 
my children, I see them at 26 and I think this is unbelievable what you are capable of. And I really think it's because they grew up living a life that really wasn't just them and, and their schoolwork. It was them doing their schoolwork with their siblings in their family, helping with the business, doing all these things. It just gave them so many more dimensions to who they are and what they're capable of doing and experiencing. And I, I do attribute a lot of that to homeschooling. And, and I know it doesn't always work for everyone, but I do encourage people to, to take a second look at homeschooling if they can, because it is far easier than you think it is. You know, it seems so overwhelming to some people. They just are, I can't do it. It seems like so much. But actually, I think it's actually easier in many ways than sending your kids off to school. And especially now with what's going on in the world, it, it is by far easier. It's different, but it's really not harder. Sure. There are many things about our homeschool life that are much simpler now than when our kids were going to parochial school. And we had a lot of logistical things that just by making our change were eliminated just right there. And of course, we have others that we are now uh, sorting through or have been sorting through since the time we made that change that we didn't at that time. And, and we've dealt with that and still deal with that and encounter things. I mean, no situation is perfect. So we still work through things, but it, there have been a great many things that have been simplified by our transition to homeschooling. And yeah. Well, one of the, one of the, the things it ties back to what you said, Jordan, you know, you said to the, the kids thanking you, they actually all go through a phase where maybe not all because they're not all grown up, but we've seen, almost all of them say, I don't want to homeschool because it's too hard. And it's similar to what you're saying. It is. You're going to learn that sometimes things are hard. It's not It's not easy. So it's actually, I think in many ways to an adult, things are easier. But to the kids, they feel like it must be easier somewhere else. It must be easier this thing because this is hard. But all of them that have said, I'm not homeschooling, it's too hard, are now saying, I am homeschooling, okay, because they realize life's hard. One of the essays for one of our children for college admissions, she actually said in the answer to one of these questions, I like to do hard things. Yeah, so she said. And then she began to give an example. So it is, it's, that's part of growing up. I mean, as you grow up, you realize you're gonna have to confront obstacles, you're gonna have to deal with things. And she was, she was one who had to fight herself back from a very poor initial test in a college class. Yeah. And she fought herself back to an A. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think she would have done that if she hadn't already had to experience some hard things and see people, as you're saying, in the whole family. Everybody runs into hard things. Everybody runs into something they can't do. And it's one of the things that I said to my son before he went off, and I've said it to the two of also. I said, here's what you're going to find at a, at a military academy versus a college. You're going to fail at things, not because it's unfair. You're going to find you can't do things, but you can be trained to do them. You can learn to do them you can recover. And I said, and the other thing that you're going to learn, and this comes from a family, but it's great to get out in the wider world. You're going to find people that you don't, that you take one look at and you make a judgment. They're actually going to surprise you at what they can do. And I think that's helped. In fact, all of our kids, uh, as they've gone off, whether the three in the military schools or not, they've realized that because I think they've experienced it in some way. And like I said, I've specifically warned them. So they'll fight back. They'll, they'll say, okay, I, I didn't do well at this. I'm going to fight myself back. And it was just great to see that that was how she summarized this essay was, I like to do hard things. That is true. I think that pers perseverance and resilience is actually one of the very good things about homeschooling yeah. because it's hard. I mean, I, when I say it's hard, now I'm going to, I don't want no, you to no, scare it, it people. It, it, things it, are hard. It, it should be hard to, it should, to get an education should be worthwhile. If everything comes so easily, you're probably not doing what you need to do. You know, it, it should be hard. If, if everything was so easy for you, I'm sorry, you're not educated up to the level that you need to be. 
that is one three thing I found about Colby. It was very challenging in different areas. And we had a few crash and burns, you know, where we had to rework things and go through things and, but you do it. And actually the kids learn from that. They benefit from that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that is one of the greatest lessons is knowing that you can overcome things and that you can also teach yourself things. You can say, if, if I learned how to do this, you have an experience with smaller things. And it's funny, even myself the other day, I was the algorithm must have heard me complaining about my schedule and stuff because <laughs> I was on social media and they advertised to me a shirt that said, no one cares, work harder. <laughs> and ever since, I was like, I should have bought that thing because ever, ever since then, that's kind of been my motto, you know, as I'm telling yeah, myself, yeah. as I'm getting up early to do work or whatever, I'm like, I don't want to do that. It's going to be a 12 hour day. And then that comes back to my mind. But Anyway, yeah, there's a lot of truth in that, and even students can learn. In fact, I've been telling my Colby students that halfway joking, they know I'm kind of joking, but I think it's permeating where they're they're repeating it back to me. Actually, now they're like, "No one cares. Work harder." So I actually, we, well, yeah, uh, I tell uh, our kids that, but in an, in a different way. Worse than that, worse than that. If you do poorly, your parents aren't going to go complain to the teacher that it was an unfair test. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a real benefit of homeschooling. No, I, I think you should tell the kids that I think it should be hard and it should challenge you. And if you're not being challenged, you're not you're not growing, really. So that I mean that's been my, that, that's been our experience in homeschooling. This has been really great. Around here we've done a number of episodes that we have titled Backstage. We like to go backstage and kind of take a peek behind the curtain how we make the Colby cast run or take a peek backstage at Colby. Thank you for allowing us backstage at Holy Heroes to hear your story and for meeting with us today and catching up a little bit on, on your family and, and your story. We sure do appreciate it and we wish you all the very best. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam.